Welcome to another episode of Candy Fresh. I'm your host, Kalik, and we also have a special guest host with us today, Essence Jones. Hey! Hey, hey give it thanks up for having yeah. me. This is, this is awesome. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm going to tell y'all, I'm usually not used to this. I'm usually the one behind the camera, you know, the one in the credits. That's usually me. I, I'm not used to this. So, But thank <laughs> you for having me. I appreciate it. Y'all don't listen to none of that. She taught me everything I know, so we're going to make it happen. It's that candy fresh, got the new now next. If you a dope artist in the city, come on and get your shine on, get your shine on. Candy fresh gon' show up, get your shine on. It's that candy fresh, got the new now next. If you a dope artist in the city, come on and get your shine on, get your shine on. So the theme of this episode is mental health. Now, some of you may not know that May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and that's something that we want to expose and get you guys educated on. And we got a really, really professional at this today. So kind of explain to them a little bit about it. About what I do? What, about what I do? No, no. Little on me? Yeah, oh, okay. Um, so again, my name is Essence Jones. I am the founder and creator of Protect Your Crown and Insight into Mental Health. Mm -hmm. And our organization is all about promoting mental health awareness and ending the stigma in mental illness. So how we do that is we go around the Twin Cities, specifically mm -hmm. in communities of color. We host workshops. We host um, discussions because mm -hmm. it really, really, this all starts with a conversation. And the whole reasoning for me starting this organization is as I was growing up, mental health was not discussed at all in yeah. my community or nor in my family. Mm -hmm. And I later found out that there were people in my um, in my immediate circle, especially my family, who were dealing with a mental illness and we didn't know anything about it. Right. And so that education piece wasn't there for me. And then the more and more I talked to people around me, I noticed that they kind of fall in the same category as I do. So I'm like, we need to we need to talk about the realness it's important. and the importance of mental health awareness. And we need to we need to get clear about what that is. You know, we're very quick to go to the gym. We're very quick to do different things yeah. for ourselves physically, but we're not taking care of our minds, and our minds can't function, or our, our bodies can't function without our minds. So you ain't never lied. All right, and for this episode, we got an amazing lineup of interviews we're going to do, starting with Dr. Kasim, uh, who's a psychotherapist, and coming up after that, we have a representative from NAMI, which you guys will learn a lot about in a few minutes. We also have the amazingly talented and one of my good friends, I will say, Miss Katana the Don. We also have True Heart Speaks in the building. Woo -woo. Just some wonderful, amazing poets from around the Twin Cities. It, I mean, these young people are doing it, and they're expressing themselves in a very positive and special way. Yeah, and you guys, you know, we can't do this without our amazing DJ, DJ Mickey Breeze in the Mickey house. Mickey Breeze. <laughs> On the ones and twos. So, you guys, we're going to turn it up a notch, and you guys are watching another dope episode of Candy, Candy Fresh. Fresh. Here we go. We're back. We're back. And we're back. So in front of us, we got Dr. Kasim here, who's going to tell us a little bit about himself. 
My name is Kasim Abdurrazak. I'm the CEO and lead consultant for Abdurrazak Counseling and Social Architecture. Ooh, that sounds that sound kind of, that sounds dope. Yeah. So that was a kind of more broad than I thought it'd be. So give us a little detail on what you actually do for your job or career, I should say, and kind of how you got to this point and what made it so important for you to get there. Okay. In 2015, uh, I was actually working in the schools and I had an opportunity uh, with African American Family Wellness. The guy yeah. who was the CEO at the time um, is kind of like a mentor, older brother to me. Mm -hmm. He invited me to come over and do some evening therapy work. And uh, I get over there, he ends up leaving shortly thereafter. And so I started in that process of just kind of connecting with them, doing evening therapy work. Mm -hmm. And then I also end up connecting with another organization, Aruba Emotional Health Services. Okay. Um, and from there, my journey kind of started. Okay, so when he left you there, what made you stay? Because I know somebody left me somewhere. I'm like, you know, uh, who I came with ain't here no more. I got to go do something. <laughs> so what made you feel like it was necessary to be there still? It was my respect for the space. Mm. Um, there was two cultural organizations there at the time. They were yeah. actually housed w within a, a larger organization called 180 Degrees. Mm -hmm. African American uh, Family Wellness and Sue Familia. Okay. I was very familiar with both of those organizations because those were the two of the longest standing cultural institutions that dealt with mental health. Oh. And so when he left, it wasn't even a question. I had to stay there because I respected the space. That's a beautiful thing. That's respect. Yeah. So with that being said, how did you transition into the work that you're doing? Like, was there, like, can you go back from childhood up until this point and knowing the things that were like, that made it very important for you to take that as a career path? Yeah. To be honestly, I, I came into this space uh, unknown to myself. Mm. I've been an athlete. That's been the social identity that I've carried for the majority of my life. Mm. Um, played basketball, football, track, all through, uh, through as a young child growing up. And then in high school, I kind of focused just in on basketball. Right. Earned a scholarship, played at Missouri S&T, ended up getting hurt, and that career was stopped short. Gotcha. And so when I came back home, there was nothing left to do. Mm -hmm. And so I had an older brother at the time. He was working with youth, and he said, man, come over here. This is probably the easiest job you ever have. <laughs> and, and he was right. I enjoyed it as much as I, I enjoyed sitting with people and listening to people and supporting people just as much as I enjoyed playing basketball. Mm -hmm. And so I began to spend as much time as I did on the basketball court, and yeah. I'm talking about hours. 10,000 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. Hours and hours in the space with people. And what I started to notice is that Again, certain parts of who I am, like I'm a middle child. Yeah. And as a middle child, you're a negotiator. You're, you're brokering that relationship with older siblings and younger siblings and being a, the, the child that's sometimes left out. I can relate. Yeah. Oh, you get ready? Right? <laughs> I'm the middle child. Yeah. yeah. Is there a middle of eight? I guess 4.5. I don't know. Right. Something like that. So I, I, I started to right away understand that there were certain attributes that I had from my childhood that, that uh, supported me in the work that I was doing with people. Very deep. So when it comes to, it's like things that are deeply rooted in people affect them when they get older as a, as a whole. Can you kind of explain what that's all about with trauma and things of that nature? Because I know, especially in the, in, the, in the people of color community, there's a lot that we deal with on a regular basis. I'm sure, you, who's your demographic that you mostly focus on? Uh, to be honest, we, we serve everybody. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, we're in the community. We're co-located over in North Minneapolis as well as in St. Paul. We have a relationship with a community partner in uh, North Minneapolis that allows us to be in that space and be with the people. Yeah. But our main objective is to be wherever the people are at. And so we work with the universities. The universities actually send their students to us. Uh, for therapy. We work with some local community organizations. And so we deal with probably uh, the, the larger part of the community that's represented within the Twin Cities area. Oh, that's really amazing. So I have like some, for me, myself, it's something I always do is self-reflection. I know it's a really important part of, you know, having a proper mental health is being able to not only focus on the things you're great at, but also your deficiencies within you. Yeah. And so I know like in the community, especially men, we sometimes want to mask what we're bad at <laughs> and amplify, you know, the things that we're great at as if there's nothing wrong with us. Like, oh, can't, can't nobody tell me nothing type of mentality. Right, so right, right, right. what is the way that that you've seen that I'm sure you see it all the time, but what are some tactics that you've learned to teach out for other people to really look into themselves? Number one, what you said is a beautiful point as it relates to who comes into our clinic. Mm. Over 90 percent 
of our client population is female. Mm. And over 95% of the males that come in, come in at the hand of some female. Gotcha. So there, and again, like, and what we do, like, again, just to explain a little bit about my organization. Number one, when we started it, it was really to, again, as I saw those two organizations that I just named yeah. fade away, it was about bringing that back, but doing it at a, at a 2.0, 2.5 level, the, 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 the elevated level. Yeah. And so part of it was making sure that we had space to support every part of the community and particularly communities of colors and particularly African-American people. Um, but then more importantly, it was about having a place for professionals yeah. mm -hmm. that fell within those social identities uh, to have a place where they could come learn and develop. And so it's a place where we're supporting people, but it's also like a development center for the professional. Um, and it's a place where we're actually, we're, we're going beyond the space of just being a therapist and we're moving into the space of become theorists. Mm. And so we're, we're not like some of these centers that we have in our community that come in and study the community like lab rats. Yeah. They set up in the community. For statistics yeah. and all those, yeah. And they work on the community instead of working with the community. We're working with the community to, 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 to gain the story of the people and then to offer it back to the people um, in, in the patterns that we're seeing as we see the majority of the people. And so when you say mm -hmm. the, the dynamic around men, that's 100% true. Men are not coming in. And so we understand as a concept that the majority of our families, there's an imbalance in the families in terms of people's personal wellness. Yeah. You have a lot more women who are seeking uh, help, seeking support uh, quicker, faster, and before the men. And the men are coming in a lot of times at the hand of a woman. I got to take some notes. <laughs> <'Cause that's, laughs> oh, man. So with that, what is a way that you draw them in? Or is it just something that people have to understand about themselves that, you know, I always say we are unfinished products. Yeah. You know, having the mindset as if you can actually be helped no matter what age you're, you're at. Because some people are like, oh, well, I'm just old and stuck in my ways. Like, right. you can't teach a dog new tricks type yeah. of thing. And it's like, that's, it's destructive to our community as a whole because then people feel like there's no one to really talk to because there's an expectation of them being strong already. But yeah. in actuality, like inside, they're not as strong as they may seem. So what are some ways that we can get in contact with your program so we can help you know, everybody out there. Yeah. The beautiful thing about uh, us as an organization is like I said, we're connected to the people, we're connected to the community organization. So we have people who are coming in, the majority are coming in voluntarily. Mm. Um, and that's actually extremely important for us because uh, the way that we position and the way we set up our space is the first thing that we tell people is that we ask them the question, we say there's only one expert in this room mm -hmm. and who is it? When we're talking with children, the children know right away, they say they are. Right. And like that's that's the that's the perspective that we have in our space is that the people who are coming in, they are the experts on themselves. And so a big part of the reason why we align and use that particular language is because when you're dealing with communities that have been marginalized and have not had proper access or support in institution, the most critical uh, point of hurt is self-determination. Mm. And so, again, identifying the client as the expert is letting them know you get to go as fast or as slow as you want. You get to go left if you want to go left. You get to go right. You get to stop the bus. You are in control because you are the expert on your life. And so we take that as, as, as a very serious concept that when people come in, you're the expert. And the other thing that we do is we identify the people that this isn't a space where you have to come in once you're debilitated. Right. This is a space where, again, if you are coming in willfully, is because you're strong and you want to remain strong. Mm -hmm. And so, we again, we reposition the people to say, yes, the therapeutic space was set up in a way, uh, like a lot of our medical model as a very deficit-based right. uh, dynamic, you come in once you're sick, you come in once you're hurt, you come in once something has happened, and no, we wanna reposition the space to say, no, let's have you in this space before that happens mm -hmm. so that you can remain strong. Yeah, man, I appreciate you, man. <laughs> like, real talk, man. We gotta find more preventative methods. Yes, please, 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 please. But we wanna say thank you, Dr. Kassim, for coming and joining us today. and. Um, we're going to have a nice conversation because I, I got some stuff that I want to yeah. learn even after this. So yeah. you guys give it up for Dr. Kasim here, guys. Yeah. Appreciate you. What What's one way that we can, uh, social media or something that we can reach you on? Yep. So the, a couple a couple of things. One is I didn't say like what we do at our organization. Three things is we protect, we promote, and we support. Mm -hmm. We protect what's sacred. 
um, which is the people. And so again, that, that, that allows us to show up in different spaces. We do consulting with organizations, workshops. Uh, we promote what's healthy, which is about us as the, the clinicians. Yeah. We can't offer and, 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 and hope for other people to have a healthy lifestyle if we're not living it. Absolutely. And then we support people and ideals. Lead by and example. so, again, one of the things that's going to be happening is uh, J June 21st, there's the Black Men Healing Conference. Mark your calendars. Yeah. And so I'll be, the key, I'll be one of the keynotes there. And also, June is the month that I'll be releasing um, a book, The Five Essential Principles oh, to Healing snap. Black Men. And raising black boys. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations on that, man. Appreciate it. We got an Appreciate author here it. too. Mm. I'm excited, man. I'm looking forward to seeing what else you got to offer to the world and let's stay connected. All right. Appreciate All you. All right, man. Yeah. So, welcome back, everyone. We have an amazing show going on right now. Um, but I would like to introduce a wonderful representative of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, better known as Ma NAMI, Minnesota. I have Cynthia Fashaw here. And you represent NAMI. Now, how long have you been with NAMI? Um, it's been about eight years this time around. Oh, wow. <laughs> so tell the people what NAMI stands for, what they represent, because I, I know a lot about it, but I want you to explain. All right. Well, it's more or less a grassroots organization, and their goal is, is to improve the lives of people who live with mental illness and their families. So um, we, do a, we actually do a lot of things. We're the people at the legislature lobbying for money. We're the people that brought you um, school-based mental health services. Um, we do support groups, um, education, both for individuals who live with a mental illness and for family members, because that's really important, and professionals. Um, today I was in a school teaching teachers about mental illness and how to better work with kids who experience mental illness. We do outreach to cultural communities. We work with youth. Um, we, we do a host of trainings and services. Um, but probably the most important thing we do is, is in addition to giving information, we give the lived experience. Mm -hmm. So everybody who works at NAMI either lives with a mental illness or they have family members who live with a mental illness. Because when we work with families, we need to be able to, to be on the level where they can relate to us and we can relate to them. And you, it, having a family member really gives you an experience that you will not find in academia, in schools, in books. Absolutely. And I know you guys have done some tremendous work and it's been over 40 years. Yeah. You guys have been at this for 40 years and that is just amazing within itself. Mm. And I know personally you guys have touched me because I didn't really know too much because I, me personally, I deal with mental illness mm -hmm. and I didn't really know much about it. Like I went and talked to my doctors and things like that, but a lot of the, <laughs> the information that I, that I received was directly through NAMI Minnesota. So I, you know, me personally, I appreciate you guys for the work that it is that you guys do. Um, so tell me a little bit about like some of the courses that you guys have, because you guys have some free courses as well, correct? All of our courses with the exception of one are free, because we don't believe people should have to pay to get help for themselves Absolutely. or for family members. And so what I'll do is this, I'll kind of give you a general overview, is, is that our courses are designed to give, first of all, um, information about mental illnesses um, in cultural communities. The information is, is designed to give you the information that you usually don't get in other places. Because usually when you go to classes, they assume that you know certain things, that you understand certain things that most people in cultural communities just don't know. So my personal work is to go into our community and really educate people so that one, they know the language. Number two, they know what to expect. They know who to expect it from. They know their rights. And they know um, about services that can help themselves or other people. So um, that's the work we do in cultural communities. We work with educators um, to do um, some real basic accommodations and modifications that are helpful for all students, but specifically for kids that may be having mental health condition, mental health challenges. Um, we work with professionals um, to educate them, again, about mental illnesses. Um, we educate legislators so they can make better decisions about um, what to invest their time and money in. Um, we educate individuals about how to help themselves and, and what kind of resources there are out there. So all, you know, we have, a, I brought a lot of books and materials today 
and they have all kinds of information that you just may have a difficult time figuring out where to get that information from. And so when we work with families and we work with individuals, we talk about how to get services. Um, we spell out what kind of services. Um, we help people with insurance to ensure they have the right insurance to get the services and support, huge support. And we've really started working on wellness. So much of mental illness deals with the illness aspect of it, which doesn't tend to give people hope for a better future. We deal with the hope and the wellness and ensuring that, that you're on a road that's headed in the right direction and you know where you're going. Right. And one thing that I've that I've learned just along the way, when it comes to mental illness specifically, people live normal lives. It's not like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like if you catch a cold or if you, you know, have the flu, you have to treat it somehow mm -hmm. and you have to be able to manage it and take better care of yourself. So I'm I'm so glad that you guys have a lot of courses and a lot of resources out there to explain that to people because the stigma is out there. That's and I huge. know that personally. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if people are more educated about what's going on and what the different mental illnesses are and how there is there is hope because mm -hmm. um and to to live a full and healthy and happy absolutely. life absolutely does not mean it's going to be a disability absolutely and a mental illness is a medical illness whose symptoms are behaviors mm -hmm. and because of how we view behaviors as at a person's will or choice we tend to think the behaviors you see associated with mental illness are a choice people have made and and it is not always and so it is a medical illness but but we look at it differently because there is such a huge stigma attached to it. Um, so part of, of my work is, is, is to promote mental wellness right. and, and mental health as a road to wellness. Right. And that includes getting treatment for mental illnesses. Now, I know one of the things that you guys do, which is totally awesome, because they have some they have some great and fun activities as well. And one of the biggest ones that I know and that I actually have a team for is NAMI Walks Minnesota, mm -hmm. which is in September. Yep. Correct. So mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about that. And like if somebody wanted to maybe sign up to walk or maybe even get a team involved and raise money for NAMI Walks. Well, we have a, a walk every September, the third week in September. It's our biggest fundraiser. But what I really like about it is it's a walk that honors people who live with mental illnesses and people who've died by suicide um, and people who are struggling. And so no matter who you are, you come and you just feel so included. Um, and we have speakers, motivating speakers, um, and, and it's about honoring the people um, and, and providing hope at that walk. So we raise money. We have a little walk, it's like a mile down, down a beautiful path and back. But it's, it's about the camaraderie, it's about the information, it's about the gathering that really makes it special. It is so huge. There's so it is many 5, people. 5,000 people. There. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it was amazing last year. It was a little hot. It was yeah. a lot hot, but I won't complain. I will take the heat over the snow any day. Me too. <laughs> so, um, so people can actually become a member of NAMI, yep. right? So mm -hmm. kind of tell us about that. How do they get involved? Well, um, first of all, we have a website. Um, right now it's namihelps.org. Um, actually, in the next month, it's going to just change to namimn.org. And you can go on the website. You can sign up for the walk. You don't have to raise money if you don't want to, or you can raise money. You can be an individual or a team. Um, and then show up on the day and have a good time. Um, other ways that you can get involved, we, we always are down at the legislature um, whenever there's an issue, a bonding issue. Um, so we ask for people who've had challenges um, in the mental health system sometimes to come and speak to the legislature if you feel comfortable doing that, to participate in walks, or if nothing else, Practice some self-care and take care of yourself. Find out what you need to ensure that you and yours have mental wellness uh, and by dealing with your make possible mental health conditions. So I'm going to ask you a personal question. Ask me since a personal we are, question. Since we are talking about um, um, mental wellness, what do you do for self-care? What do you personally <laughs> do for self-care? I have to ask. Well, you man. know what? I do a lot of things, but I think my top three things are as I ride bikes, um, I live on a hill in all directions or downhill, so you got no choice. If you get down there, you're going to have to ride it back. Mm -hmm. So I do, I, I bike ride. Um, I go to something called the Salt Cave. <laughs> have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it, but oh, I've never been. Oh, it's in Minneapolis. It's great. And so what it is, is, is it's a cave that has um, Himalayan salt rocks there. Oh, 
and it's, you know, they have the temperature set at 78 degrees in these chairs where you don't have any pressure on your body and there's like sand on the floor. And they go through a relaxation exercise with you. And then he closes the door and for 45 minutes, the lights are down, you hear the sound of the ocean and you inhale the salt, which is good for arthritis and your respiratory system. Um, so I do that. Um, I also do a little bit of, of mindfulness and meditation, mm -hmm. and I have a relaxation CD on my computer at work, and when times get stressful, I put that on. It's no words, it's just calming music, so. And sometimes I just go find a friend. Right, right. <laughs> that support system is key sometimes. Oh, it sure right? is. Well, I want to thank you so, so very much for being here. I know, I know you guys are super busy, oh. <laughs> but thank you so much for <laughs> being you here. For you guys me. stay tuned. We'll be back with another interview for Candy Fresh. <laughs> All right, we got another amazing interview coming up for you guys. So we got a group here that goes by the name of True Art Speaks. Can you guys introduce yourselves for me? Yeah. I'm Terrence Shambly Jr. My name is Catherine. And yeah, my name is Kari. Uh, my name is Hugh. All right, all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Really appreciate you. Um, tell us a little bit about True Art Speaks, what it stands for and what type of things you do for the community. Cool, well, um, True Art Speaks is an organization that I've been uh, privileged to be connected with over the years. It is founded by our current executive director, Tish Jones. Ooh, um, Tish. If you don't know Tish, look Tish up. One of the dopest people I've ever met in my life. So um, I'm really grateful for the work she has put in to build this organ. Our uh, True Art Speaks mission statement is to cultivate literacy, leadership, and social justice through the study and application of spoken word and hip hop culture. Okay, okay, I love it, I love it. Hey, give it up for him, man. Any of you guys got any, he said everything, huh? He said, he said, drop the mic, drop the mic, we good. All right, so when it comes to your advocacy, what types of things that you guys speak about when it comes to poetry and teaching out to the community? Um, Tread Speaks is really good. One of the things they do is hosting youth poetry slams, which is how we get involved with Tread mm -hmm. Speaks, one of the ways. Um, and they have a very good rule of anything can go on stage. You can talk about what you want. Um, this year I focused a lot about mental health because it's a topic I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really good at opening a space that is both safe but also welcoming for things that might not be safe to you. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay, okay. What was Another going on? Way. Yeah. Uh, um, another thing uh, that Troy Speaks does too, uh, um, 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 is we host a uh, a open mic called Reverb Open Mic. It's hosted uh, every Thursdays from six yeah. to eight p.m. at Golden Time Cafe. Ooh, Golden Time! Y'all know about it—the community yeah, spot. You know, you know, the space is all ages. Uh, it's free to all people. You get six minutes on the mic. It's another great space to uh, to come and speak your story. That's dope. Um, I think one of the coolest things that True Art Speaks does is they are a youth organization, but also um, they they create space for the young folks who are in the program. So when they leave, they like, can also become part of it mm -hmm. and get jobs and also like become working artists. Um, there's like opportunities for folks because because the Slam series is only available for uh, young people from the ages of 13 to 19. Yeah, but. Um, you know, like once you hit 19, like True Art Speaks doesn't abandon you, right? Mm. There's like, there's opportunities for like folks to be involved in the program and the organization um, at whatever age. Yeah. Um, and so there's opportunities for like, young folks who uh, um, can learn to be like organizers or uh, working artists that way too. Gotcha. So it's like an alumni program that's yeah. after it as well. That's always good. Because that's the one thing I'm passionate about with programs. Like, even though after you get done with them, What's the follow up? Like, okay, like, oh, all right, you're done, beat it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. But how about yourself? Um, yeah, I would agree. I have worked um, as a mentor and a slam coach over the years. Mm -hmm. And actually, about was almost 10 years ago, I was coaching 
and Hugh was on the team that I was coaching. Hey. I was co-coaching with Kyle <laughs> uh, Tran Myrie, also known as Guante. You may know him as that. So we were co-coaching, and he was on that team. And now he was co-coaching this team. It's like the opportunities continue once you have grown out of the program. So you know, pass pass the torch or something, huh? Right? <laughs> yes, yes, happily. <laughs> That's awesome. And so my next question for you guys: How did you know? As True Art speaks, like you guys are advocates and you also are vocal about the things you feel strongly about. How did you guys build up that courage to actually get on stage and perform your pieces and things of that nature and being so transparent with, you know, the audience? Um, for me personally, the way I got involved with True Art Speaks was going to the open mic I was just talking about. Um, I remember the first time I went there, um, I signed up on the sheet and stuff, you know, yeah. and they called my name. And they called my name, and I sunk deeper into my chair. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm just going to act like I'm not here because nobody right, right. knows me. Uh, I, I was just really nervous, and I did not want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think a huge part of uh, me, like, actually choosing to go up there and choosing to go up on every stage I choose to go up on is just, uh, it's just understanding that it's okay to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay to be uncomfortable, you know, just being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and knowing that, uh, knowing that everyone is human and like everyone is gonna, like all the other poets are feeling the same things that you're yeah. feeling, you know, you're not isolated. No, that's facts, because I, yeah. I heard there was a quote, and I'm probably gonna butcher it, but it was more or less, you know, the moment you stop feeling those butterflies is the moment that it's not fun to you anymore. Mm. So it's like, ah, oh, well, I've, I've conquered this already. Yeah, you know, yeah. you always wanna be hungry, but oh man, this is another crowd, I gotta, I gotta get it together. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I'll be the same way, trust y'all probably seen it. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that being said, with you guys being the, the advocates and the voice of other people that may have certain things, how do you guys, you know, what is your process on the pieces that you work on? You know, what are some of the subjects you guys speak about? Um, I'm always wanting to make sure that I'm speaking my own voice. Like, I never want to overshadow those who also or like who could speak better on it um, for, for things that I can speak about. I like to give my story from it. Um, and I feel like that just helps like make it personal and let people know that this is how I feel and if this is how you feel, you know, we can connect over that. It's, it's shared for people. That's awesome. I like to write a lot about myself. Uh, I think I've learned a lot about myself from just thinking more about myself and like challenging myself to talk about things I don't talk about. Yeah. You know, it's like, a poetry is very liberating in that way. Mm -hmm. you, know, you learn a lot about yourself. Like, right, because you yeah. actually, you dig deep. You yeah, gotta, you can't, exactly. you can't like, let me see what's in this bag real quick. Oh, I forgot about this. <laughs> <laughs> right. How about yourself? Um, I would say I often, my curiosity often is equally split between myself and what's out outside of me. Mm -hmm. And so I try to apply like whatever compassion or curiosity I would extend to myself, I try to apply that to whatever the situations around me that I'm also writing about, even if it's painful or difficult. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I don't know if there was like a purpose behind that. I think I just naturally gravitated towards how can I reach out to the world around me as well as figuring out my own stuff. Uh, I think I write to uh, try to understand the things I don't know. Mm -hmm. and um, and try to observe the world uh, as a way of participating with the world. Um, I think, you know, growing up we all like have like these shames that we're told like to never talk about. Right. And so like I think, you know, like a lot of like mental health stigma, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, I think the thing about being stig stigmatized is that it's incredibly lonely. So like when you're dealing with a lot of things, you're just really isolated. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I try to write as an attempt to feel less lonely, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That was really awesome. And just thinking about that, like, far as writing and then the fact that you guys share your pieces with the world gives you, you're, give, you're a platform that other people don't necessarily have the courage to do. So you guys are empowering a lot of other people in the process. So I appreciate you guys for real for that, like, sincerely. Because, you know, I might just have to... Yeah, like for real. Might just have to pull out my pen and pad real quick and uh I don't know, I ain't gonna be cold. Maybe you guys can teach me. 
right? Maybe just a little bit. Well, uh, I just want to get to know how do we get in contact with you guys? Where is the facility? Where can we follow up? Where can I hear one of these spoken word pieces and utilize what you guys got to offer? Yeah. Um, True Art Speaks is based in the uh, Twin Cities. I'm not sure if we had like a at headquarters, you could just like come walk into to see us, but you could uh, um, email us at True Arts. Actually, I don't know our email. Do you know our email? Yeah, I was about to. Well, I think you just go to the website. Google. Uh, TrueArtSpeaks.org, but the true does not have an E. So TruArtSpeaks.org, and it's got a bunch of info. All right, you guys better check them out. I know I will. Well, thank you guys for joining us, and uh, this is a dope interview. Appreciate you. Oh, I like that. That's a that's, that's a, my beat. That's a funky beat, ain't it? That's my beat. Is so, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Make you breathe. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone. Um, we have the amazingly talented. And oh, when wow. I tell you, she is like a you you like a triple threat. I would say to okay. me anyway. Right. You're a triple threat. You uh, sing. Okay. You yeah. rap. Yeah. You do a little soft shoe. A soft? I don't know. Soft shoe? Tap dance? You don't tap dance? Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know so we that. have the amazing Katana the Don here. Everybody go ahead and welcome her, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I, ooh, I like that breeze. Okay. He's killing it. Right, right. <laughs> so thank you for stopping by. I know you just got off a tour. Yeah. Was it your first one? No, your it was, first it was actually my third. Ooh, yeah, ooh. Yeah. Okay. Well, well. Tell us how it was. Oh, Share man. with the people. It was pretty amazing. You know what was I mean? Uh, I gained a lot of a lot of support from different people, and um, it really was like um, it's like exactly the place that I needed to be at this moment in time. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I was prepared for it, and I knew how to prepare for it. That wasn't self destructive. You know what I mean? So I was more ready than I think for the previous tours. Yeah. Right, and you tour with Carnage, correct? Carnage, the execution. Yes, he is super dope. He's so. in, he's incredible. Like so. every show was completely different. So so tell us what was probably the the coolest place you've gone on your tour this year. Um, uh, that's hard. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll say two spots in Wisconsin. It was the first spot in Madison. Was pretty dope. Madison gets kind of crunk. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but maybe Madison was the one. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it was pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, we had a pretty awesome uh, freestyle session afterwards, so that was okay. that was nice. Cool. And I sold a lot of merch that day. Oh, so. okay. You can't can't go <laughs> yeah. can't go wrong with merch. So tell right. us, for those of you who don't know who you are, how long have you been in the game? Because you've been in the game for a long time. Well, uh, a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, I started rapping when I was like nine. You know what I mean? Um. My dad's a musician, my brother's a musician, so. But being in a rap game, per se, I would say probably about 20 years, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just like consistently rhyming, recording, either with my brother or by myself or with groups or mm -hmm. at studios. You know? That's a long time. Yeah. That's a long, you got accolades and stuff, you got, you got so EPs, long. you got albums I did a couple stuff. of things. All right, yeah. all right. Now, as we know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I right, had right. the opportunity of actually interviewing you for a web series um, called uh, Beyond the Walls for yeah, Protect Your for Crown. Sure. And I and I still want to thank you for doing that because not many people want to talk about the things that they have gone through and how they've overcome it. So right. just kind of give a summary of kind of what we discussed as far as dealing with mental health and mental illness specifically. Well, you know, a lot of people don't just automatically assume that, you know, I have depression or like like a crippling anxiety at times and uh, PTSD from a lot of sexual abuse and, and stuff like that. So a lot of people don't think that initially. You know, I thought I was just shy, but I learned out that it was a little bit deeper than that. You know what I mean? Because the way that I dealt with being shy was to try to drink or do other things that were self-destructive in order for me to communicate with people. And I just thought, well, I'm just partying. You know what I mean? But it just, it kind of took a downward spiral at a certain point. Because if you keep doing the same thing over and over, and it's not the right thing, it initially, it's like something that Oprah said. You know, it starts with a pebble. Right. Turns into the rock. Right. Then, then it it's a boulder. boulder. Yep. You know what I mean? You ain't lying. And I got a couple of boulders thrown at me, mm -hmm. so. 
I I had to really take myself seriously, like right. what was going on. And one of the things that that I noticed a lot of it is you put it into your music, yeah, and that's like your outlet for right. you. Yeah. So yeah. you know, and and it's amazing. Like let me let me tell you guys some. Okay, <laughs> so I was on Facebook, right? I oh. typically don't do social media that much. But I was on Facebook, and Janet Jackson's birthday was yesterday, yeah. right? And you released a dope EP. Oh, well, thank you. A dope. Yeah. And when I say, I'm like, oh, oh she need to, wait, wait a minute, yeah. hold on, because she perform this tomorrow. But then <laughs> I'm like, okay, she just got off tour. She can't perform. So what was what was your inspiration behind some of those songs on there? Oh, because man. a lot of them were really deep. A lot of them were about self-worth. Right. You know, you know, I'm not going to, you know, anybody, but I'm not going to let anybody dim my light right. type, type song. So tell us where that inspiration came from. Um, you know, Janet was like my idol when I was growing up. She's shy. She's soft-spoken. I was the same exact way, tomboy, all of that. So... I didn't understand how she could get on stage and do anything. You know what I mean? Because I thought, well, if she's shy, you know, like, how are you doing all this? Right. So it was a big inspiration to me to know that you can have those aspects of your personality and then still perform and still, you know, execute a, a great performance. Because she was amazing, you know what I mean, on stage. But um, it, it also was, like, very uplifting for me to see a black woman that wasn't skinny or light-skinned or anything like that that was given these accolades like Grammys and all of these things for her talent. So uh it was it was a big it was a big influence on me on in like junior high when I was a teenager and everything seemed like okay, I'm I'm too black, I'm too this, I'm too that. So then when I saw her it was like, oh Maybe I'll be all right. You know what I mean? Okay. I mean, even though she's Janet right. Jackson. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but yeah. you could kind of dine, though. I'm me Let's now. Clear. I'm me. I, I grew into myself. Yeah. All right. So so let me ask, because I, I like to ask this question. Okay. What do you personally do for self-care? Man, uh, a collection of things. Like, for the, the tour, I knew about it for, like, a year. Mm -hmm. Because, obviously, Carnage knows, you know, all of my situations, you know right, what I mean? Right. So I'm very open and honest with what's going on with me and you know, he, he respects that. So he let me know like a long time in advance so I could mentally prepare for it. Because being around a lot of people or groups of people on a consistent basis is very difficult. So I had to really like, I burned sage and you know what I mean? I just right, prepared right. mentally, I meditated. You know, just to be, like, ready for whatever was going to happen. So when I get into tour mode, really, it's like, it's a different situation. Because then I'm I'm prepared for it. Right. But uh, one of the other ways that I, pre I prepare for uh, just life in general <laughs> is uh, meditation. You know what I mean? And, meditation uh, is deep. Yeah. But it music, making music is a good way for me to get things out, like, you know, if it's like something really traumatic or a trigger or something like that, I have a tendency to just go in the lab and I just make a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when I tell you she got some dope beats, she got some dope beats. So oh, that's nice. where that triple threat comes from. So oh, you're a producer, so, yeah. a writer. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot more. You yeah, got, that's you, a couple. Of yeah, you things. got a few <laughs> threats going on. Yeah, so yeah. you know, but you're 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 super dope. So thank you. Um, so let me let me ask you. Let me see how I want to do this. So if someone inspires to get into the music industry and they are kind of shy and are kind of hesitant about getting right. into it, what advice would you give that person? You know, like I said, mentally prepare. You know what I mean? Like you you have to kind of just approach the stage as a, a completely different place. You know, like, like you're not on earth at that moment. You know what I mean? So you can really elevate your game. Because if you, like I can actually look people in the eyes and rap to it. It was a period of time where that would have scared me to death. You know what I mean? Like, right. so I had to prepare, and I tried it, and I did it a whole bunch of times. I stepped outside of my boundaries. You know what I mean? But I mean, that took a lot of therapy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it took time to get to that place. You know what I mean? But, but I would say just keep on trying the same thing until you feel comfortable. Right. You know what I mean? Right. That's dope. Yeah. So lastly. If people wanted to get your music, they right. wanted to listen to it, wanted to buy it, or wanted right. to buy merch. I get it. Where can they find you? Uh, you can just go to katanadadon.com. You know what I mean? I'm on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, wherever the audio, Mac, wherever you listen to music, I, I'm on there more than, more than likely. Yeah. All right.
right. All right. Well, there you have it, Miss Katana Dadon. Hopefully next time you come by, you will perform. Oh, yeah. We're we going we gonna to wait until long after you done have some right, right, right. off a tour and things Oh, like yeah. That. I'm ready. So, I'm ready. Next time. All right, y'all. Stay tuned. This is Candy Thank Fresh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's that Candy Fresh. Got the new now next. If you a dope artist in the city, come on and get your shine on. Get your shine on. Candy Fresh gonna show up. Get your shine on. It's that Candy Fresh. Got the new now next. If you a dope artist in the city, come on and get your shine on. Get your shine on. Candy Fresh gonna show up. Get your shine on. All right, thank you guys for joining us for another dope episode of Candy Fresh. We had an amazing lineup. And I also want to give a special shout out to you, Essence Jones. Aww. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. I hope I did a good job. Oh, you did your thing. As uh, you Ahita will be back <laughs> next episode, and I will be back to floor directing. Oh, okay, okay. We just want to say thank you guys and hope you guys learned a lot about mental health. It is very important, and we hope you guys take the time to analyze yourselves and reach out to those who can help you. Oh, you got any input that you want to say before we all we wrap Take it up? Take care of yourself first. Big facts. I hope y'all. Take care of yourself first. Before you can do anything for anybody else, you have to take care of yourself first. Absolutely. We just want to say thank you to all of our guests that joined us today and um, especially our amazing audience. So you guys, you know, tune in next time to another dope episode of Candy, Candy Fresh. Fresh.